I just want to thank uh, Jonathan Greenblatt and uh, thank you to the ADL for the invitation to uh, speak with you. The ADL's papers in the American Jewish Historical Society in New York were a boon to uh, my book. And the ADL has more collections in its possession that I don't think have ever been seen by the public. Whatever they hold, uh, those archives matter. They could be a gold mine. And I hope that they will be preserved and made accessible to researchers because the collections will shed light on the ADL's history so that more Americans and actually future ADL leaders can learn it and learn it with the kind of de uh, de uh, complexity and depth that it deserves and that it has not yet received, bringing the ADL's legacy alive to more Americans. Let me discuss the ADL's interest in the John Birch Society. A small band of anti-New Deal businessmen established the Birch Society in 1958. Robert Welch, founder, and the others were rich, white, and almost uniformly Christian. The founders combined mainstream associations with beliefs widely seen as fringe. Three of them had served as president of the National Association of Manufacturers, and one of the men was Milwaukee Sentinel's Man of the Year in 1953 and led the YMCA. At the same time, their views occupied a spot on the edge of the political spectrum. They regarded the growth of government in the first half of the 20th century, U.S. participation in World Wars I and II, and the unrelenting expansion of welfare programs as steps toward living under communist rule. Despite their wealth and status as colossi bestriding the world's most dynamic economy, the men shared a rage at what they considered a string of failures and deceptions that had brought the United States to its knees. They had a simple sounding goal. Their plan was to teach the masses about the internal communist threat to the United States. By the mid-1960s, the group had recruited some 60 to 100,000 upwardly mobile, white, Christian, often suburban men and women to join local 20-person chapters in their communities. Birchers held many beliefs. I'll sum up just a few of them. They rejected virtually the entire post-World War II U.S.-led international order, urged the United States to get out of the United Nations, and warned of the greatest threat to the U.S., political, media, and other elites. One Birch leader told a rally in 1974 that the nation's establishment had imposed, quote, planned shortages of consumer goods on the country and had to be brought to justice. Quote, we're going to take Nixon and Kissinger, McGovern, Fulbright, politicians of that sort, and we're going to try them for treason, and they'll be hanged, he said. Newsmen, take that message and publicize it. The message they'll get is, the Americans are coming. And about 400 Birchers gave him a standing ovation. Birchers filtered a conspiratorial brand of single-minded anti-communism through the perceived needs of their towns and suburbs. More than mainstream conservatives, Birchers trafficked in conspiracy theories, fluoride in the drinking water, one Bircher document warned, was, quote, a massive wedge for socialized medicine. Finally, Birchers defined freedom on their own terms. It was not access to the ballot box for all, nor was it freedom to act in accord with one's own precepts, and it certainly was not the freedom from want. Their conception of the republic demanded the dismantling of the welfare state and dreamed of imposing their own version of Christian values on American schools and culture. Critics argued that Birch ideas fostered bigotry and that the society was a safe harbor for racists and anti-Semites. But Birch leaders insisted that members had to pass a kind of test to demonstrate their, quote, good character and religious ideals. They denied that prejudice had any part in their movement. Public relations director Tom Davis said charges of anti-Semitism were, quote, the worst kind of defamation. Robert Welch blasted accusations of racism as vicious nonsense. ADL's leaders viewed such denials with a healthy dose of skepticism. The Holocaust was fresh in their minds, and they had had firsthand brushes with Nazism. 
In 1934, future ADL National Director Benjamin Epstein was studying history in Berlin when he saw firsthand how Hitler seized power. In 1938, future ADL General Counsel Arnold Forster recruited pro bono lawyers to help the ADL combat Nazi plots against America. In 1941, the ADL's future director of fact-finding and public relations in New England, a man named Isidore Zach, became a counter-espionage expert for the U.S. Army. And during the war, Zach led a team of undercover operatives on a hunt for fascist spies in the northeastern United States. Post-war, ADL's leaders made it their mission to expose what they considered, quote, a vast enterprise of hate operating in the United States, and called on the ADL to find, quote, ammunition for the war to make our land a more perfect democracy, as National Chairman Meyer Steinbrink urged. In February 1959, just two months after the Suspert Society was founded, Isidore Zach learned that an activist he was monitoring was opening his homes to meetings of a new group. Zach, again, the uh, director of fact-finding for the ADL, wanted to find out more. The ADL was probably the first organization to track the Birchers, and its anti-Birch campaign ultimately became the most effective of all of them. Zach's agents had code names. They set out on missions to find any shred of anti-Semitic, racist, violent, or totalitarian evidence on the part of Birchers. Operatives obtained chapter membership lists, ran credit reports on Birchers, ferreted out their employment records, wrote down their license plate numbers, and even obtained a codicil to one Birch donor's will. Some of the scariest or most unflattering bits ended up in the press. The ADL's campaign, sometimes called Birch Watchers, unearthed numerous examples of Birchers' anti-Semitism, racism, and even admiration for Nazis. An ADL spy infiltrated a Birch front group in Connecticut and reported that he overheard Birchers singing the praises of Adolf Hitler. ADL's Pennsylvania director discovered that a Bircher, a likely Bircher named John Noble, was giving speeches to Birch audiences featuring a conspiracy theories that bones found at Buchenwald came from American soldiers killed by communists and not from Jewish victims of the Nazi death camps. The ADL apparently apprised the FBI that Noble was, quote, inciting racial turmoil. The ADL also exposed anti-Semitism at the very top of the Birch movement. The Anti-Defamation League revealed how Birch founder and University of Illinois classics professor Ravillo Oliver was giving talks in front of hundreds of Birchers about what he termed, quote, a conspiracy of the Jews. Oliver claimed that Israel had exported LSD to sow chaos on college campuses in the United States. The ADL program revealed the society's violent-tinged rhetoric and the possibility that its members would carry out attacks against minority groups. Two agents codenamed Ben Brith, a play on B'nai Brith, were troubled by what they described as, quote, John Birch Society involvement in the purchase of weapons and infiltration of gun clubs. Another ADL monitor reported that when civil rights picketers showed up at a pro-Birch rally attended by thousands of people, the crowd's mood turned sour and ugly. The ADL agent quoted one attendee saying, quote, give me a machine gun and I'll mow those bastards down. The Bircher propensity to brand critics as traitors to the United States and to lash opponents with dehumanizing rhetoric also caught the ADL's attention. When an ADL agent codenamed Boss 7, Boston number 7, attended a Birch speech, a drunk stockbroker who was a member of the society yelled, Com Synth, commie sympathizer, any time, quote, someone in the audience made a statement that was anti-John Birch, and the ADL was concerned about a potential escalation to violence. The ADL understood how Bircher's conspiracy theories evoked long-standing anti-Semitic canards that sinister forces, code for Jews, controlled the money supply, the news media, and the global order. 
They documented how white supremacists saw the society as an ally and linked arms with Birchers to promote massive resistance to civil rights. The ADL chronicled much of this in its newsletters, press releases, and books. And its program applied to economic pressure on some individuals affiliated with the society. The famous Los Angeles haberdasher, James Oviatt, who was a Bircher, sent some 3,000 customers an anti-Semitic tract called Common Sense based on the notorious protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Oviatt refused to renounce the mailing so the ADL issued a press release criticizing his anti-Semitic activities. Oviatt sued the ADL for libel. In his lawsuit, however, he complained that, quote, the Jewish press and, quote, an international secret Jewish fraternal society had conspired to harass a patriot and damage his business, thus proving essentially the ADL's original charge. The ADL was deft in the way it used the press like an athlete jawboning a referee. The ADL's information was often a crucial addition to media stories about the Birchers. After one newspaper in Orange County, California, used ADL research in an article critical of a society national spokeswoman who was spreading conspiracy theories, ADL leader named Harvey Schechter called the paper's editor a good friend of ADL. The society understood that the ADL posed a significant threat to its reputation, and the ADL rankled Birchers to no end. The society's national spokesman, John Rousselot, said of the ADL, quote, they are on our backs all the time. A different Birch leader charged that the ADL was, quote, a Hitler agency. The ADL was not the only organization keeping tabs on the society. The Anti-Defamation League was part of an informal anti-extremist coalition in the 1960s that included the White House, the NAACP, the union-backed Group Research Incorporated, and other individuals and organizations tracking the far right. But the ADL stood at the apex of the, this coalition, and it probably did more than any organization to expose the society's dark side to the world. The Birch Watchers ginned up negative press and made the society toxic in the eyes of many Americans. They neutered the ability of violent, conspiratorial, white supremacist elements to win elective office or dominate either party. And Birchers were forced to spend time, energy, and resources fending off the ADL's charges. The incessant public conversation about Birchers as a hate-filled group generated the impression that the organization must be tainted and ought to be shunned. The ADL's program triumphed. By the 1970s, the Birch Society had become a shadow of its old self. Now I argue that Birch ideas lived on, but the organization shriveled. It had money woes, it had lost members, and it had lured more and more violent, bigoted individuals to its ranks, sowing internal strife. Yet few factors were as significant in the wilting of the Birch Society as the ADL's campaign to expose its hostility to democracy, tolerance, and pluralism. Had the ADL's documents not been available in the archives, it would have been impossible for me to tell this story. Ultimately, it's a tale of the ADL living up to President John F. Kennedy's praise for the Anti-Defamation League for its, quote, distinguished contribution to the enrichment of America's democratic legacy and its tireless pursuit of a quality of treatment for all Americans. Thank you.